Um, uh, brothers and sisters, it's a good day to be here with you today. And uh, I say to you, thank you 10 times for inviting me. It's a good one when I speak to the people. They say to me, Brother Maui, you come from Africa. Do not have a, I'm just faking that really bad African accent for you. How y'all doing? <laughs> What's up? Wake up, y'all. I know it's about 4.30. Maybe you're thinking about dinner already. Maybe you're falling asleep. That was actually a really bad Nigerian accent. Although I'm from Ethiopia, I can uh, no longer do Ethiopian accent. I'm excited to be here with you in Boston where it's warm. I just came from Chicago. So seven degrees. And uh, I had to have a little grit to get here. I, my flight got canceled and rebooked six times. So, I, so some speakers will say they are happy to be here with you. Uh, I think I have uh, proven that by being here today. And I'm excited to share and chat with you about um, my favorite topic, which is social emotional learning. And uh, I love social emotional learning. Um, I've been working in social emotional learning ever since I graduated from Harvard as an undergrad. And just kind of thinking about why I decided to get into the field, I remember one of the student speakers at our graduation, uh, they had a comedic speaker. And, uh, and he said something like, you know, here at Harvard, we go into every field known to man. Everything from investment to banking. Right? And that's because, uh, you know, everyone wants to work at Goldman Sachs, right? Even if they had no interest in banking as soon as you're graduating, right? And, uh, and for me, uh, like many of you in this room, I had a deep uh, interest uh, in education, you know, from the beginning. For me, it was personal. Uh, as you see here, this is a picture of my family in Ethiopia before we came to this country as, ref as refugees. We'd fled the war in Ethiopia. We were in, ref we were in a refugee camp for three years in Sudan, and then I was resettled in this country uh, at age, uh, age seven, in first grade. Uh, I learned English, uh, was resettled in Chicago, uh, and grew up in, I had the opportunity because of phenomenal public, uh, public schools to uh, have an opportunity to go to Harvard, and then found my own company, and, and be here with you all today. And you know, the thing that, social emotional learning is something that I'm deeply passionate about for a couple of reasons. Um, and, and to really show you the first reason, I'm going to ask uh, the first two rows that are here to just stay in your seats, okay, do nothing. Everybody else, do me a favor, stand up, okay? Just do me a favor, stand up. And here's what I want you to do, okay? I'm going to ask you to do something you probably have not done before. I'm going to ask you in a moment. I'm going to give you just 45 seconds. You've got to be fast, right? Because I only have 45 minutes to present. I'm going to ask you in a moment to introduce yourself to one person who's standing up. And here's how I want you to do it. I want you to pretend and imagine that this this is the person that you have been wanting to meet your entire life. Ever since you were a little kid, you had posters of them up in your room. If I were to look on your phone, their mug would be right there on that phone because this is your hero. Lo and behold, learn, launch, pull some strings. They are here. I know what you all do in the East Coast to show the celebration right now. So hugging, jumping up or down. But you have 30 seconds to show the true passion you have to meet your hero. Go, right now, do it. Let's see it. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Boom, let's get some energy in here. Come on. Wow. Here go. All right, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, have a seat, have a seat. Thank you. Thank you very much, you did great. Go ahead and have a seat, that was fantastic. Now, now I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for doing that activity. You did it just as I asked you to do and I appreciate that. And you did a great job. You were chatting. And the question I have for you is, when you were doing that activity, when you were doing that activity, and we did it for about a minute, you were engaging that person, did you for a second forget about the first two rows who were not doing the activity? Right? You kind of you, you kind of did, right? You, it's not, and it's, it wasn't personal. It's, I asked you to do it that way, right? And um, it's not that any of you came and, and kicked any of the people that are here. So if any of you came in and beat them up or did anything bad to them, it's just, y'all had value? You were excited to see each other? First two rows, nothing personal. You're just not a part of that, right? Now, we did this activity for just a minute, right? How many of y'all know that for students in our schools, for millions of students in our schools, this is not a one-minute activity. This is one year, 
four years, seven years, for sadly, for some kids, 12 years. Well, I was one of those students when I was growing up. I was a kid that was invisible. I was a kid that had really low self-confidence. I was a kid that didn't believe I had worth. And I was a kid, quite frankly, who wasn't engaged that often by people who said, hey, I see value in you. Why don't you come be a part of what we're doing? And yet I went through a process where I gained in confidence, where I realized I had value, where I learned how to connect with others. And I can tell you, three, uh, my three years, my three worst years were in middle school, like most people, those three years of isolation, to me felt in some ways worse than being in a refugee camp for three years. Because that, you're, what the world is telling you is you don't have dignity or value. And part of my motivation to get into social emotional learning was to prevent just any kids in this country from experiencing that kind of pain inside of schools. I found out from traveling all over this country is you don't have to be a, a kid from Ethiopia who's growing up in low-income housing in the States to experience that kind of isolation. There's kids of every race and background who go to school and feel that. And that's a core tenet of social emotional learning. We want every child to belong. We want every child to have that emotional oxygen when they walk into a building to feel like it's, they belong there. They have a community there. In the intro, we mentioned our work in Miami-Dade. That's one of the things that I'm really proud of is, is we engaged those 49 schools this year. That was a key reason the district engaged us, is they said, help us with the sense of belonging at all 49 middle schools. We don't want one kid to feel like they don't belong. Right? We want all of them to feel connected. That's the first reason that uh, I'm so passionate about social emotional learning, just from a purely existential kind of what is it like for a student to exist in our schools. And yes, there's research that shows that when kids have higher sense of belonging, that leads to higher test scores and things like that. But I think just for anyone who cares about kids, period, aside from the test scores, we don't want to run schools where kids are invisible, right? Just in terms of the kind of schools we have. So that's the first reason I'm so passionate. The second reason is, uh, you know, when I was in eighth grade, a few uh, ran into me. Uh, my family had just moved. Uh, and it wasn't by choice. We, we just ran out of money. And we moved into low-income housing. And um, I had C's and D's in some classes when I was in eighth grade. Um, I got kicked off my basketball team for doing some stuff I wasn't supposed to do. I was really at the, I'd say the low of the low. Um, my father at that time, uh, you know, from first grade, 12th grade, my father was legally blind. Um, he had cataracts and glaucoma in his eyes. And, you know, four years later, four years later, I'd gone through a transformation. It wasn't external at all. I still lived in the same low-income housing. Um, my father was still legally blind. You know, in some ways, externally, my life had gotten worse. Uh, my best friend in the world for most of my life was my older brother. And uh, he, he actually had passed away when we were in high school. And so by all external things, my life got, you know, had either stayed the same or gotten worse. Yet four years later, I'd gotten to every college I applied to, um, including Harvard, where I attended. Um, I had become an all-state athlete in track. Um, and I had grown in confidence to the point that not only could I be uh, in that group, but I had the confidence to reach back and help other kids who were invisible. And how did that happen? What was, the, uh, what, what, what was the source of that? Well, the way I think about it is we all go on two journeys in life. There's an external journey, right? You can see what we all look like. I can see the color of your skin. I can, you know, maybe I can see your business card, what's on your business card. Um, as a student, you know, it's, 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 as, as kids growing up, we mostly live in the external world, right? What happened when I was in high school was through the help of some mentors, I actually started out with some stuff at my church. Um, I, I, learned to, uh, I learned to journal. Um, I learned to think about my internal world. I learned to think about, uh, I learned to reflect on my life, to take five or 10 minutes to think about what it is that I wanted to do. And I'll jump ahead a few slides. This is actually a snapshot of an actual journal uh, entry from, from uh, my senior year in high school. You can see what I wrote down. Ouch, I got a 31 out of 40 on a key physics test. My grade is down to a 92.7 equals 93. So I was calculating my own grades in every class to a decimal point uh, before I got the progress report. I now have four high A's. I list out my grades, I list out my GPA, 5.83 out of five point scale. And the kid who in eighth grade was getting C's and D's um, was able to go on a, on, on a process of introspection and reflection where I could guide myself, set goals. And what I saw from my growth was, I saw that, hey, if, if I could do this, <laughs> if a kid living in low income housing who um, didn't have a lot of what you might consider advantages could grow um, by harnessing a lot of what we now call social emotional learning, I want to share that with the world. I want to help kids of all backgrounds and races um, understand that, they were, that all of us are, are, are on two journeys in our lives, the external and the internal. And we bring those together 
that gives us a lot of power, right? So that's, that's really how, how it started. And you know, when I first started speaking and writing, uh, I wrote some books that were published by Little Brown and Company. Uh, it was a great Boston company that then moved to New York, right? Many of you will, will remember. Um, and uh, social emotional learning, maybe 15 years ago, it wasn't really, I wouldn't say it was in the heyday of its field, right? Um, that was more the time of No Child Left Behind, where our country wa uh, uh, was very focused on standardized testing. And, and, uh, and SEL, um, through the help of organizations like CASEL. Let's, can we, if anyone who cares about social emotional learning, can we give CASEL a round of applause? Okay, if you all know, if you don't know what CASEL is, Google them. They really are an example of an organization that has advocated and made a big difference. Um, and there's a, actually a number of organizations in the Midwest that have had a lot of impact in social emotional learning. But folks like, like CASEL, uh, you know, folks like the University of Chicago, it's another great Midwest organization. They have a consortium on school research that has really advanced the field of social emotional learning through their research. I encourage you to look at their research. Folks like ACT in, uh, out in Iowa City, who have a holistic uh, framework for development that goes from you know, early childhood all the way through uh, career. These are, these are folks who are helping to innovate, right? And now it's accepted in our country. We're now at the point in our country where it's accepted that social emotional learning should be a core part of every student's education, right? That's, that's, that's addressing the needs of the whole child uh, is now, it's not, it's not controversial at all. Uh, most districts accept it. Uh, a, lot, a lot, some states have standards for it. And it wasn't like that 15 years ago. So that's been really exciting for me to see. Now, there are some in the field who say, hey, you know, there's a pendulum that swings back and forth where people say it's all about, you know, holistic uh, education and it goes back to the standardized testing and it's going back and forth, back and forth. And right now we're just in the heyday of the, you know, of the holistic child, um, but it may switch back. Um, I, I actually think something different is happening. And the reason, uh, the reason is that um, there are some new things happening with the workforce and AI and automation. And this idea that um, that the skills that our students are going to need in the future are, are going to be wildly different, right? And if you, if you Google uh, artificial intelligence, automation, future of the, uh, of the workforce, um, there are a lot of folks who say things like this. Uh, seriously, you're asking about the workforce of the future as if there's going to be one, you know? So there's folks who assume that the robots are going to do all the jobs and we're all going to be, you know, un un unemployed and there's going to be universal basic income, that kind of stuff, right? Um, McKinsey released uh, a, a report. I encourage all of you to Google it and check it out. Uh, it, it's, it's, if you type in McKinsey Future of Work, it's a really nice report that looks at some of the trends, what's coming in the future, right? And what they find is that uh, looking ahead by 2030, uh, you know, and, and, and a good way to read this chart is uh, it's when you see the negative 14, negative 15, the 8, the 24, the 55 at the bottom, that's the change in hours spent by 2030. And what you're going to see is that, uh, as you could expect, with the advent of AI, with the advent of, of automation, robots, um, physical and manual labor, those jobs are going away, right? There's going to be a reduction in those hours, right? And, and what, the, what, what the best minds of our time are saying, where the growth is going to be, are going to be in the areas that, um, uh, that, the, that the machines and the robots can't necessarily do as easily. And social emotional learning is one of the areas that's predicted to grow the fastest, right? And so what I'm saying is, it's no longer the case that we're talking about social emotional learning as a whole child versus you know, focusing on this. It's, it's more just now about the future. Like if we want our kids to have jobs, if we want them to be employed, if we want them to have opportunity, like social emotional learning is a core part of preparing kids for that in a world increasingly dominated by AI and machines. The Pew Center released a similar report, and it said, tough to teach intangible skills, capabilities, and attributes such as emotional intelligence, curiosity, creativity, adaptability, resilience, and critical thinking will be the most highly valued. Right? And this makes sense intuitively, doesn't it? That as we move forward, um, these are the things that we want our kids to be really good at if we want them to have uh, opportunity in the workforce moving forward. Right? And that's really why I titled my talk, Social Emotional Learning in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Saying that uh, the workforce is going to be different in the future. You know, it's, it's um, the rote memorization uh, is, is not going to cut it, right? Just being able to do um, some of the basic things will not cut it. Being able to uh, apply um, uh, and problem solve dynamically. Uh, and all this is going to require social emotional learning, right? Now, I'm going to cover three areas 
in, in, in the main body of my presentation. Um, and I'll jump into those in a second. Uh, for those of you who are on Twitter, that's my handle, at Maui Learning, at Maui Askadome, on Facebook as well. If you have any comments or thoughts, please share those uh, at your leisure. So the first thing that I really see as being critical in the future with social emotional learning, preparing uh, our students for the future, is you know, with social emotional learning, it can be really easy to focus on the models and finding the perfect model, and finding the right research, and making sure all that looks really good. For our students to actually have opportunity, they're going to have to apply social emotional learning dynamically, right, in situations that are unpredictable. Now, these are my three kids. I have a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 3-year-old. And my 10-year-old recently uh, came up to me and he said, hey, Dad, I want, uh, I'd like $25, right? It's like, man, is that, by the way, is that the age when kids start asking you for more money than usual, right? Before I was used to like a dollar, two dollars, but is that, is, that, is that it for those of you who have kids? Uh, age 10, I was a little surprised. I'm like, that's a little bold, $25. So I asked my son, well, what are you going to do with the $25? Now, I'm going to give those of you out there who think you're with it, with youth culture, to prove it to the entire audience if you can tell me who's on the next slide. Who is that? Anybody know? Fortnite, that's right. Anybody know who it is? Who is it? Raven? That's Raven, right? So this is the skin. This is a skin you can purchase on Fortnite for $25. Now some of you are confused out there because you're thinking to yourself, hey, when I was growing up, if I had $25, I bought a game. You know, I bought RBI Baseball. I bought Tech Mobile for those old school folks out there. And you play that game. What I'm saying is you get the game for free now, but now if you want your character to look cool and have cool dances, you got to pay for that. So for obviously... You know, I'm not, I, I was not too happy about that. I'm like, hey, so you want me to give you $25 so when you go around shooting people in Fortnite, you're wearing different clothes. Is that right, son? He's like, yeah, that's right. I'm like, okay? It's not going to sit too well. Now, now, you know, we like it when kids set goals that we agree with, but here's what my son set as his New Year resolution in this class. My goal is to get a win in Fortnite. I'm going to achieve this goal by playing Fortnite every day. All right? Now, educators love it when the kids write, I want to practice my math every day. I like that grit, okay? I like that, I like that kind of growth mindset, right? Oh, I'm going to read every day. But we, we, start to, you know, we start to wonder about this SEL stuff when the kids are setting goals uh, for Fortnite, right? So now one of the aspects of social emotional learning that, that uh, I think is so critical is that, is that all kids have a voice, right? And, and the kid's voice isn't necessarily what our voice is. You know, what our kids like isn't, isn't going to necessarily be what we, what we like, right? But recognizing what that voice is and then harnessing that to help the kids apply social emotional learning is a lot of what we do, right? And how we engage the students. So now one of the challenges I have with my son is he's been playing viola for a while and he, he doesn't like to practice that much. So I thought to myself, how can I use this to my advantage? So I took him to the public library. We set up a tip jar there. Here he is playing. Uh, his so how much money do you think my son made in 45 minutes in front of the public library? He was nine years old at the time, cute nine year old, what do y'all think? And in 45, tell your neighbor, what do you think? All right, you're very, very good guesses. I heard 50 up here, he made $49, okay? $65 an hour for a 10 year old. I happened to get coffee with my son right after that. I said, son, do you understand something? You know, I didn't say this in front of the barista, of course, but I said, hey, this barista is going to work for four hours to make what you just made an hour? You're only nine years old. Now, how did you do that? Well, you had a problem, you wanted something, and we came up with a creative solution. And you were able to make a lot more money than what most nine-year-olds can, because you use your mind. And you didn't just say, I can't have this. I'm not trying to teach my son, well, you can't have something. Well, let's think creatively about how you can accomplish it. Also, what assets do you have? If I come at it and say, well, you're nine, you don't have any assets. No, we all have assets. Like, that's a fundamental pillar of sound social emotional learning. Everyone has assets we can, lev we can leverage. We're asset based in our thinking. Why am I doing this as a dad? It's because I'm trying to teach my son we want to apply the social emotional learning. You know, one of the metaphors, most popular metaphors we have at Maui Learning for social emotional learning is the idea that we are all agents, right? So there's a lot of research on locus of control, internal locus of control, external locus of control. And what we say is, when we act as agents, we're hitting our turbo button, 
right? And it's a simple thing for kids to understand, for teachers to understand. Hit that turbo button. Take action in any situation. You want the Fortnite? Take some action there. Now, is it easier? Would it, is it easier for me as a dad to just get out $25 and give it to my son? Yes, that'll be faster. Because now I gotta drive over to the library. I gotta watch him, make sure nobody kidnaps him, right? And I gotta, right? I gotta be there, and I gotta uh, make sure he says thank you and all that kind of stuff. And I gotta go through the lesson with him. Um, but if we want our kids to actually be able to apply the SEL and to experience its power and say, yeah, this has value for me, um, we have to be willing to do that, right? We have to be willing to engage the students in that way and have them actually work on things that they care about. Otherwise, SEL will just be a chart for them. It will just be a worksheet. It will just be a poster that their teacher talked about that's not relevant to them in their own lives, as opposed to a dynamic tool they can use to solve problems today and to create bright futures and solve problems later on when they're adults. You know, the whole application piece of social emotional learning is absolutely key for me because I believe for myself as a first generation college, college student, um, being, uh, a, 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 being a student at Harvard, it was the ability to apply the social emotional learning that helped me graduate. Like being able to show up and journal my first year, being able to build social capital by doing different activities, being able to have the growth mindset when you are in a calculus class and it's really difficult and you feel like the other kids are smarter than you and yet you don't doubt yourself. So being able to apply the social emotional learning is actually what will help our kids. That's a much higher bar. It is a much higher bar than teaching kids the social emotional learning. It is much more difficult, particularly when you take into consideration that if you talk to educators, we survey educators a lot in our work, we ask them what's your number one challenge and they typically say it's not enough time. I already have too much stuff on my plate. Most entrepreneurs a lot of times, because we're trying to get the funding, right? We think the biggest problem that the teachers have is they don't have enough money, or the schools have is they don't have money. But most of the time, you're fighting for that minute, right? You're fighting for the attention, because they already have so many things on their plate, right? And so for those of us who are trying to do this work in SEL, the way to do this work well is keep it as simple as possible and focus on application and show the students, show the teachers that what we're gonna give you from an SEL perspective, will actually save you time. When you do this SEL, it will save you time, right? Because you're gonna be able to solve problems more quickly, you're gonna have less discipline issues, and your school's gonna run better, right? And life will, this will actually make life better for you. And that's part of our job as entrepreneurs, is to recognize that, and to show that this is true to our partners. And when we do that, they wanna partner with us, right? Not just because we're helping them with the SEL, but because we're helping them with their pain point, which is, I can't, I'm overloaded, like, I can't even think. So talk to your neighbor for a second. I love doing a little just conversation among, among the audience, even a bigger audience. 30, 40 seconds, what do you think about this concept that SEL must be applied to be useful for students today and to actually be relevant for them and equip them in the future? We have to teach them how to apply that SEL or it doesn't work, right? Talk to your neighbors about that. What does that mean to you? Does that sound right to you? Do you agree with that? continue. I hope we'll continue these conversations. 
Um, and you know, most most entrepreneurs, most entrepreneurs in ed tech who start a company, it's because they have a particular view on how they want to make the world better, right? Um, I know it may not seem that way to some of the educational institutions out there when we're trying to pitch our products to you or you've had 100 calls, but we, we, we do what we do because we want to make a difference, right? And, and, and I, I think I speak on behalf of all the, the entrepreneurs that are here. And for me, if you were to say, what is the difference you hope your company makes? If there was only one thing you could do, one thing you could contribute. Um, I would say that we helped advance SEL towards, towards application. We helped the industry understand that we have not helped a student if they can't apply the principles dynamically on their own. Um, because guess what's going to happen is, like my freshman year at Harvard, my parents didn't move me in because when you're a low-income kid, a lot of times if you're not from the Boston area, you have to move yourself in. Right? My mom couldn't drive to Boston, couldn't drive to Chicago, which is 30 minutes away. Um, but I have something I don't take out of the house very often, but this is actually my journal from my first year when I was in college. It's got the date on it. It's filled up. I would argue it was much more important for me to be able to uh, write out my goals and reflect for five minutes and identify um, and think through my external internal journey that, that was much more important for me to be able to do that than to have my mom or dad drop me off Because this gives me power on a daily basis to navigate a challenging environment And this helps me apply and use and it empowers me to later dream and imagine and reflect even to the point to, to, in, in terms of what I do today um, This is what I want for all our students, right? Um, it's it's my dream. It's why, it's why I founded Maui Learning is to be able to help the students apply the SEL so they have power to move towards whatever it is they want. If they don't apply it, we have not empowered them. I truly believe that. And that's why, um, and that's, that's, if you were to say, what's the thing that you most wanted to share with the audience of influencers and folks who are shaping policy and building companies and, and interested in SEL, it's that point that we're here to make a difference in students' lives. We're not just here because we came to the conference, we're all here because we care about the kids. Right? We, want to do, we want to do it right. And uh, my belief is that requires application. Right? It's a, hard, it's a, hard, it's a hard, higher bar, but it's what true empowerment looks like. Now, if we move ahead, if you look at the literature, in terms of AI, and what's, what's going to happen is the AI is going to keep getting smarter. Right? The robots aren't going to get dumber. They're going to get smarter. Right? Every year they're going to get smarter. They're going to have more data. Uh, the programmers who program are going to get smarter. We're going to find more uses for them. Um, well, we're going to have to get smarter. <laughs> Um, our rate of learning is going to have to increase. Right? Our ability to be lifelong learners is going is, is to have to increase. And that's what all the literature says. If you look at all the studies, they always say one of the things that the companies all say, um, that the education institutions say is, we have to find a way to help our students become lifelong learners, like true lifelong learners. Right? And I like lifelong growth as a term a little bit better because it's a little more challenging of a term. Like, like, we're not just learning, we have to grow. Right? We have to intentionally grow. Right? So let's talk about what that means a little bit. Right? So here's one of our students that we work with uh, who took one of our classes and she sent this to us recently. So this is a real student. We got permission to share her picture from, with, from her. She emailed us and she said, the PERT test is basically a placement exam for college courses. I took it about two weeks ago and I failed the math by five points. I thought I was a failure. I've never achieved the goals I wanted in life. Kyla, you ever had a student like this at one of your schools? A student who encounters a challenge, who thinks they're a failure? who thinks that something was too difficult, too hard, too challenging, right? If this is what the student is experiencing now, what's going to happen eight years from now when she's asked to reskill in an area that's pretty difficult to learn in? Isn't it going to be a similar challenge? I had to reskill. I had to learn a new trade. Uh, the job I had signed up for is no longer there, and I have to learn something else. Well, it's not like that journey to reskilling is going to be uh, you know, conflict-free, where everything's going to be perfect. It's going to be the same challenge, right? So, how do we prepare a student like her, right? How do we prepare a student like her? And this is really where um, that growth mindset is so critical. That growth mindset, my favorite uh, kind of way to simplify growth mindset is, is, is just a simple metaphor, the rock and the plant, right? So the rock with the fixed mindset, you believe you cannot grow, right? You cannot grow your skills and intelligence. So when Kyla says, I believe, you know, I can't learn this stuff, she's static. She's like a rock, right? She's that immovable fixed point. Growth mindset, of course, you're like a plant. You believe you can grow. You believe you were meant to grow. So it's a rock or the plant. What do our students believe about, our, about themselves? What do the millions of displaced workers, what are they going to believe about themselves when they're asked to retrain? Are they going to believe that, well, I'm too old? I don't have the assets? I can't do this? Um, that wonderful nonprofit set up this program, but there's no way someone like me can learn this stuff, so I'm not going to try? 
So growth mindset is critical, is absolutely critical for this work, right? My favorite metaphor for the growth mindset that we've, we've used and tested for about 10 years now that works really well is what we call the can-do, not yet circle. It's very simple circles. The can-do circle is, it represents all the things we can currently do. So if you can drive a car, driving a car is in your can-do circle. The not yet circle consists of all the things you cannot do yet. So if you can't operate a helicopter yet, that would be in your not yet circle, right? And by the way, notice how I said that. It's with enough training and the right support, you know, most if not all of us should be able to operate the helicopter. That's a growth mindset, right? Even we think it's hard, right? Um, as opposed to, I could never do that, right? So, go, uh, story I share that, that can kind of illustrate why this is a powerful tool is when I was a freshman in high school, I was on a track team, I ran the mile in four minutes and 50 seconds, okay? So that was my, if you said, that was my can-do circle. Now my senior year, uh, my goal was to break the school record, which is four minutes and 18 seconds. So that was in my not yet circle, right? Now I ran on days like today, when it's you know, seven degrees here in Boston, I ran like that all throughout the off season in Chicago, in January, December, I would sometimes have icicles on my face. And my mom would see me and she couldn't believe that I was running in that weather to train. How many of y'all think I broke that record my senior year? What do y'all think? You think I smashed that record? All right, look around the room. Hey y'all, I did not break that record, okay? <laughs> That's why it's a good story, right? Isn't this what happens to us a lot of the time? Like we all have goals. As entrepreneurs, you have goals, the things you're trying to achieve. As educational institutions, our students, we all have goals. So my senior year, I got fourth place in the county championship and I ran a 428 mile. And my can-do circle, look what happened to my can-do circle. It expanded to include the 428, right? And this is really how we want to think about success, is success is when I grow, right? Success is when I grow. Success is not when I run the 14 mile. Success is when I grow, and failure is when I do nothing to grow, right? If we teach our students this lens for success, what it does is, first of all, it gives every student a chance to win every single day, because we can all grow regardless of what our starting point is. And then two, it shows them that it's all about the growth, right? And, and, not, and not focusing so much on whether I was as good as that student or that student, right? For, this, for Kyla, um, who took one of our courses, we trained her in these concepts. We helped her understand that her intelligence was not fixed. She sent us, it was too long to put on PowerPoint, but she sent us a long letter where she explained that she passed the PERT, but more importantly, she changed her view of what it means, of what it means to, to be a learner and her ability to learn. Now, what does this mean for our students? What does it mean for our kids? What does it mean for all of us? Um, the best advice I got on, on, on studying, on excelling as a learner, um, was from my seventh grade teacher, Ms. Countryman. And she said, many students endlessly review what they already know. If you want to grow, study what you don't know. And these are the parents who come to you and they say, hey, my kid was studied study for two hours. He still did a bad job on that, he got a D on that test, what happened? Well, you know what happens most of the time if you dig deeper? The kids spent almost the entire two hours on the stuff they already know. It's like the basketball player. I've coached four seasons of basketball the last two years. I have a lot of kids on my team. They will only dribble with their right hand, okay? And, and the reason they only dribble with their right hand is they don't like the feeling of the ball bouncing off their toe with their left hand. They like the feeling of success when they make that right hand layup. And what that pretty much guarantees is they will never be good with their left hand, right? And, and that they will be a limited basketball player, right, who can do a few things, but they were not willing to engage the growth, right? Now, Kyla, who you saw earlier, she's not going to be able to grow if she keeps studying the stuff that, that she got wrong before, that she got right. She has to go into the not yet and attack that. And this is what people don't understand about, about social-emotional learning. We all instinctively get the part that's caring, that's, hey, you're in the front two rows, we see you, we hug you, we want, we want to make sure you're, you belong in the school. True social-emotional learning that's going to prepare our students to be successful in the future, um, it demands tremendous courage and it demands, it demands um, an orientation to being uncomfortable. Like my kids, a lot of times, if, 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 they, if we tell them, hey, play your viola or violin for 10 minutes, they'll play Twinkle, Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star if we let them. They will, right? They'll be like, hey, I, I, I always get that right. And we ask them to play a more challenging song. Sometimes they get frustrated. Sometimes they get tears in their eyes. Sometimes they even cry. You know what I say to them when that happens? I go up to, to, to my daughter, Bryn, I say, Bryn, you, you, you upset right now? 
She says, yeah, why is that? Is that because, you know, song is hard? Is it frustrating? Yeah, it's frustrating. I can't get the song right. And I feel honored that I have the privilege as her dad at that moment to sit next to her and to say, hey, Brent, in our family, we live for that moment. We live for that moment of frustration. We step up and we crush it again and again and again. And that's what makes us good. That's what makes us learners is we don't step back. We, we, don't rush, we don't rush away from that and retreat twinkle twinkle little star. We step into that challenge again and again and again. If we want to prepare learners of all backgrounds to be successful in our schools today and also to be successful in the future, we have to, uh, this has to be a core part of their thinking. That they're going to embrace the discomfort, they're going to try the things that are harder again and again, and then when something doesn't work, when they get something wrong, they're going to always figure out why. They're always going to know why they got it wrong. And they're not going to rest until they, got, until they know why they got it wrong. That is a sign of a true learner who is harnessing that growth mindset, who is going to leverage the best science of social emotional learning to grow again and again and again. It's the idea that students will stay in their can-do circle if we let them. They will, right? Like, <laughs> that's why we have dads, we have teachers. We have, we, we have to be the ones that challenge them to get into the not yet circle. And they're going to get to that growth point, which is where the can-do not yet circles meet. And they're going to try to retreat. And they're going to, they're going to want to stay in the can-do circle. And we have to, as educational institutions, as ed tech entrepreneurs, um, just all of us together, we have to continuously show the students how to get into that not yet circle again and again and again. Or as my daughter likes to say, into that almost their circle, right? She likes that, she likes that, she added that for me, right? And so at another time, you know, I have about five minutes. Uh, if I had more time, I would share with you uh, the third area I was going to chat with you about today was social mobility, kind of like my views on how SEL impacts social mobility. Uh, and uh, particularly from my perspective, um, uh, I guess the only thing I would share with you is um, what people kind of don't, don't see, <laughs> what people don't see is the thing that makes it a lot harder than it looks is um, people assume that, hey, you graduated from college, even a college like Harvard, and everything's going to be fine. Well, you still have a ton of challenges. Okay? You're, you're still living in low-income housing. Okay? You're still living, um, uh, if you're coming from a low-income background, uh, you're dealing with a lot of trauma in your family a lot of the time. Right? Some of the, on um, this article I encourage you to all look at, um, uh, this was a devastating article for anyone who cares about kids. I encourage all of you to check it out. One in four kids in this Houston school district um, are, uh, have experienced severe violence in their lives. Right? Uh, and I see this when I go speak. I'll go and I'll speak to, you know, to, to, school, to some schools and out of, if they have 500 kids in the school, if you ask them how many people in this school um, have had a family member pass away, um, it'll be like three in the year, right? Or two, or one. You go to some other schools out of 500 kids, it would be like 50 or 100. I mean, it's, it's shocking how different the numbers are, right? And, and, and so people are going through different experiences, coming from different backgrounds, right? And engaging, and so that's what is one of the big challenges for all of us, those of you who are working in higher ed, those of you who are working um, uh, with, with the students who are 23, 24, 25, um, who are trying to navigate so many things, where they're trying to care for their families and, pull, and, and help themselves at the same time. When you're coming from that low-income background, um, you have that extra layer of not just bringing yourself up, but also bringing up your family and trying to help those around you. And that, I'm not, I'm not here saying that it can't be done, but I'm saying, because it can be done, and it has been done, and it will be done many times again. Um, it's just, there are many things that are not obvious, right, to, to someone who hasn't lived it that make it really, really challenging, and, and that, makes the SEL even more important. A lot of folks, I remember reading some articles where a lot of folks were saying, well, you know, um, we don't like this focus on grit. We don't like this focus on growth mindset because it's, it's blaming the kids from low-income backgrounds for when they actually have had a lot of grit and growth mindset. You know, with all due respect, I view it op in, in a different way. Um, I think the kids from low-income backgrounds, I think kids from backgrounds like myself, we have to be even better at the grit and the growth mindset. Like, like we have to, we have to, because we're going to need to be better <laughs> at it to uh, get to where we need to go. Now, I'm going to ask, uh, if you have further questions, um, uh, want to know more about our work, uh, you can learn more at MauiLearning.com. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, of my colleagues here. Ivana, raise your hand. She's here. So you, can, you can chat with her. Aaliyah, who lives right near here, is here. You can raise your hand. Um, we'll be hanging out as well. Um, our passion, as you heard, is the social-emotional learning, 
putting it into practice, ensuring the growth again and again, so that our students truly are ready, uh, not just to be successful in your classrooms right now. I think the imperative is clear now with AI. It's no longer about being successful in the classrooms in your schools. It's without that SEL, they will not be ready for the, for the future. They will not be ready. It's not about sense of belonging anymore. Just that anymore. It's no longer just about um, making sure we get them into college. It's they won't have jobs. They won't be able to care for their families. They're gonna have a lot of difficulties. And that's why all of us in this room really have to do this work together. Last slide I'll share with you in my last 90 seconds is, uh, you know, one of the things about education that I believe, the root value that brings all of us in this room together is the love that we have for our students and for, and for each other and for the work we're trying to do together, right? That's why we're, we, we all, regardless of what company we're from, and I had an experience when I went and met my grandma a few years back. I met my grandma a few years back uh, in Ethiopia where, uh, and I hadn't seen my grandma in over 20 years, and the entire time I was with her, my grandma would put her hands on my shoulders and she'd say things like this with me. She'd say, which means, may you live to see your children's children. Or she'd say, which means, may you have the wisdom of 1,000 people. So I thought to wrap this time up, we could all do an Ethiopian blessing together. Come on up, stand up. Everybody can participate now. The front two rows too, okay? You're no longer isolated, okay? Thank you. Um, before we do this blessing, I want to give a shout out to my good friend, Bill Tryant, who helped set this up. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Eileen, for inviting me uh, to be here with y'all. Thank you, guys. Um, and uh, so go ahead. This is the touchy-feely moment of, of Learn Launch. Go ahead and put your arms around each other's shoulders. It's okay. It's okay, y'all. Go ahead. I know some... Uh, and uh, there you go, there you go. You got to do the air there. And I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Um, and, uh, and again, I apologize. I didn't have time to do more of the social mobility or to walk you through our online uh, courses and things like that we do with EdTech. Um, but you can find out more about that at any time. Repeat after me in Tigrinya, and I'll translate for you. Sahai? K. Wakaka. Isho. K. Wakaka. Kab, Lali, Nab, Tati, Amla, Yahaluka. What you just said. <laughs> Man, you're lucky to sign video, or I, or I had you say something crazy, okay? <laughs> but I had some fun with you. What you just said is, again, thank you for being a great audience. What you just said is that the sun may not scorch you, nor the thorn pierce you, and from the heavens, to the earth. May the Lord protect you. You've been a wonderful audience. I hope we get together again. Thank you so much. <laughs>